This is John Cole with OKRod.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. In this episode, I'm gonna go ahead and answer your guys' questions. I apologize, there's one of me and I have lots of subscribers over all the different social media things I use. So I, in general, have a policy not to respond to individual questions. However, if you do wanna ask me a question, you can ask me in the community tab, which I'll post a link down below on YouTube. Post your question there and it may get selected for next month's Q&A. So the first question is from RT. John, can you do a video on how and what meals you prepare for your parents? My mom is 92 and not someone who eats healthy. When I prepare meals for her, she will eat them, but I would like to see how you handle this issue for your parents, thanks. All right, RT, so the challenge is, my goal with my parents is to you know get them to be as independent as they can <laughs> and prepare healthy things on their own without me having to take care of them. I mean, I respect caregivers highly, but that's not what I want to do with my life necessarily. However, that being said, I do want my parents to eat healthy, and I, I think it's sad when they go out to eat and get all this to-go and prepared foods. That's not as healthy as it could be or should be, in my opinion. So what I have tried to do in the past is actually when I make my own food, because I make it in bulk, I'll make extra, and I'll give it to them to eat. So that by far is the easiest way because now you really you're not going out of your way you're just making extra food that you would normally eat and I package it you know in a mason jar with a vacuum on it strong vacuum on it 20 inches of mercury and then they could eat it most of the foods I make for them if it's you know fresh foods will easily last a week and if it's you know prepared foods that have been heat processed they will last two weeks you know properly you know in the fridge so that's my goal, but that being said, when I gave them the stuff I like to eat, they're like, oh, we don't like this. And then they don't want to eat it, you know? <laughs> and that's, that's their right, that's up to them. You know, so I'm like, all right, they don't want to eat what I make, that's fine. And then I'm like, all right, well, I've got to at least make something for them, so at least they're eating a little bit healthier, especially when I have such an abundance here in my garden. So basically, I'll post a link down below to the video, how I, how I make healthy food in the Instant Pot for them. I'll basically harvest all, a bunch of greens from my garden because that's what I grow primarily. And then I use a lot of other plant, whole plant foods and I, I heat process them in the Instant Pot including mushrooms and butternut squash and purple sweet potato, purple potatoes and even bitter melon, other random, you know, locally grown sourced ingredients that I could supply and then of course other organic ingredients. And then I heat process that for them and then give that to them. So for the, for the while, I was actually just making that for them and giving it to them, and I wouldn't actually eat any or even try it. <laughs> Nowadays, I will hold some back and actually keep some for myself because if it, because my belief now is that if it allows me to eat more vegetables, then it's a good thing. I don't like, you know, eat a lot of the heat processed vegetables because my, my goal and preference is to eat it raw. But, you know, I also understand that each way you process a food, and then consume it will affect our microbiome differently so I, I don't want to like necessarily neglect my microbiome because I think raw food is always the best. Raw foods in most cases is like really good and better in most cases than heat processed food but you know I believe at this point in my life that I shouldn't discount heat processed foods when you know heat processed in the best way possible without using any kind of oils or salts or extra sugars added to it. I'm making stuff super clean, ultra clean, super high quality. So yeah, that's what I gear for them and that's that's what I'm doing at this time. Just recently I gave my parents some of the extra juices I made. Sometimes they like my juices and sometimes they don't. And I hate when I give them things and they basically just, I, I go over there every, you know, once in a while and I see the stuff in the fridge that they just gave them a bunch of and then they didn't consume it. And then it makes me sad because like I could have eaten that, right? I mean, I did a lot of work to put my work in and effort to make healthy things for me then I'm glad to share but if they're not gonna even respect it by eating it and let it rot in their fridge you know I'll take it back and then I'll consume it you know so yeah that's how it is and that's what I do so Caroline Miller I'm interested in what you are doing to improve your gut microbiome after your microbiome test all right Caroline so my, mic my microbiome was not as robust or have the diversity of the bacteria that I'd like so you know the main Thing. you know you can't do everything at once but you could start small so I have tried to number one increase the varieties I'm eating of different types of plant foods 
you know, eating more than just fruits and vegetables these days, including reaching out and eating things like millet and quinoa and, you know, purple rice and beans, different kinds of beans, different kinds of mushrooms, you know, uh, purple potatoes, purple sweet potatoes, even purple yams. I really love my purple vegetables. Um, I'm going to be harvesting my sunchoke soon, which is probably the number one food that you know, the microbiome testing company, Ombre Labs, recommends to people to improve their microbiome for some reason. Maybe that's uh, correlated with a lot of different studies with microbiome improvements, so I need to eat more sunchokes. So that's step one. I've been basically trying to include more and not just do straight up mono meals. I try to do dual meals where I'm eating, you know, instead of just eating only mangoes, I eat mangoes with some blueberries or I'll make a smoothie with, you know, five different ingredients because that'll give my body different kinds of fibers and more importantly phytonutrients that can feed my microbiome. Now aside from just eating a greater diversity of things I've also been trying to eat a little bit more probiotic rich foods so you know kefirs, um, you know coconut kefirs, uh, you know fermented foods I make my own fermented foods so I try to eat those. The goal for me is that I try to you know avoid the ones that have excess salt in there and most of them have too much salt added. Salt is not necessary to ferment vegetables I also have been, you know, increasing and trying to increase my natto consumption and tempeh consumption. You know, those are also uh, healthy fermented foods and I believe that in general soy should be consumed uh, fermented for the best results. Although you could heat process and eat them cooked, you know, I prefer to ferment the soy like the traditional Asian cultures, um, you know, ate it. So aside from changing up my diet, you know, and, and playing with that a little bit, the other thing I've been trying to do is, uh, you know, take specific supplements and I've been kind of failing on some of those counts because some of the supplements I take, some probiotic supplements you need to keep in the fridge and when they're in the fridge I forget about taking them so I'm not taking them regularly or consistently because um, that would be another something very important to me. I'm, I'm taking the Pendulum Acromancia or Glucose Control product that has the Acromancia uh, which is a very important like, like base species for the microbiome and I was low in that and you know centenarians have pretty good amount of acromancia and then acromancia creates this which then other bacteria eats this and then it's like a whole cascade of litany things that could happen when you don't have enough acromancia. So that's one way I'm doing it but I've, I've barely taken any of those supplements. The other thing I've been starting to do is take a HMO or human milk oleosaccharides. Um, I'll have a video on that one of these days. Um, that's uh, I take take it in two forms. So one is actually I take human breast milk that has been freeze dried in one product. Um, I keep that in the fridge also and I haven't taken a whole lot of that. And the other product I take is basically just a freeze dried or dried powder that I take with the HMO which is human identical uh, milk oleosaccharides. I was not breastfed as a kid and this is the third largest component of breast milk and that basically is said to feed our bifidobacteria and acromancia. So that's the specific reason why I'm taking the HMO product and I've been taking it maybe two, almost three months now. This is my third bottle I've been, or jar I've been going through. I get the powder and I take like two to three scoops a day trying to dose up on that. To, you know, it's basically like a prebiotic powder feeding my mi microbiome and I'm going to do another retest soon on my microbiome to see if my acromancer or my bifido bacteria has increased. So wish me luck because, you know, uh, other people's have increased by taking this product, the acromancia and the bifidobacteria. All right, let's move on to the next question. The Queen of Dreams, have you already done a comparison video of the Nama versus the Norwalk juicer? I'm curious to know your thoughts. No, I have not. So it is on my list to do that. You can look up previous videos I've made like the Omega VSJ843 versus the Pure Juicer. I have a Norwalk here, but I won't show that in the videos because the Norwalk company is out of business but you can get a Pure Juicer, which is basically the improved Norwalk. They are still in business and they're a great company, uh, you know, to work with and, you know, that sell an amazing juicer that has been improved significantly over the Norwalk. Also has a long 12 year warranty that is actually transferable. That's unique to their company. That being said, each juicer has its own pros and cons. I do own a Pure and the, and the Nama and, you know, each, each one has its pros and cons, you know, for me personally, I prefer overall the J2. It does make a lesser yield in most cases. There's a few exceptions to that rule. But in my opinion, it also makes a higher quality juice. 
because you're processing at a lower RPM on the first stage and then on the second stage when you press out in the press cloth, the press cloth will, in my opinion, hold back nutrients. That being said, you know, if your goal is enzymes because they're the most important thing, then you might want to go for the pure because in published study, the pure shows it has a more enzymatically rich juice. In my opinion, the enzymes could be a good thing, but they could also be a bad thing because the higher enzyme activity means that there's gonna basically break down the nutrients in the juice sooner. So if you make a juice in the pure, you should probably drink it a little bit quicker. And I have not seen any you know, phytonutrient testing on juices made in enamel versus a pure. My personal opinion is that when we, if you tested it, you know, in a lab for phytonutrients, of course, depending on the phytonutrient, you know, one or the other juicer may win, or but may win. But I think the overall trend would be to the NAMA due to it keeping more fiber in Cybol and maybe even some small amounts of Cybol fiber in the juice that the NAMA would just exclude. All right, next question is from RV Boondocker. Hey, John, I need about 80 to 90 grams of protein a day. How can I get that? Wow, that seems like a lot of protein. Um, but, you know, whatever path you're on, I'm not here to question. So if I was needing to get 80 to 90 grams of protein, that's an awful lot of protein. You know, if you're going to be plant-based, you know, a lot of people might take protein powders because that's literally just, they isolate the protein out of the food and then sell it to you as a protein powder. So now you can ramp up the amount of protein you're taking. I, I know for older adults, it is important to increase your protein. Um... But my goal would be to get my protein from food. So, you know, eating greens, you can could, you could get a lot of protein from greens, but you can't eat a lot of greens. So juicing greens could concentrate some of the protein in there. Other ways of protein, <clears throat> if I was going to take some kind of powder, I would take lentine powder, which is duckweed powder. It's a whole food, but it's very high in protein. And I would also eat algae powders, such as blue-green algae or spirulina, as well as chlorella. Um, these algaes and the duckweed or lentine powder is a brand name have high levels of protein so I just basically eat a lot more of that stuff to get my protein from whole foods as well as eat a healthy protein rich diet if that is your emphasis that being said in my personal diet my goal is to have a balanced protein diet I don't want to overdo any of the major macros I'm going to eat just the right proportions for me. All right, next question is James Smith. Do you know if psoriasis can be cured with a diet similar to yours? I remember you mentioning that you cured a skin problem you had, but I don't remember which skin condition it was. So I had eczema, which is similar but different than psoriasis. You know, I'm not a doctor, so if you want to cure anything, please see your doctor. That being said, I will tell you my personal experience. My personal experience is that I was able to get rid of my uh, eczema like 99 percent or, or, or on occasion i'll get some itchy stuff you know if i'm not following my program correctly you know that being said my belief is that these situations and the reason i have the skin condition is because of microbiome imbalance and you could mask that by eating healthy foods that can improve your microbiome but the goal is to get your microbiome in shape so you know that'd be my first thing i would do and i've already done is get a microbiome test to see you know where mine is at and I could see the deficiencies because I know X many ways and probably maybe psoriasis too is probably implicated with a unhealthy microbiome especially as a child if you had a lot of antibiotics and or weren't breastfed of course there's other reasons for that too and I'm no expert on this topic that being said I have also met other people with psoriasis that did follow a raw vegan you know or high nutrient diet and they have also you know healed themselves of the psoriasis as well that being said, this is not an overnight process. Oh, I ate raw for one day and it's not gone. <laughs> you know, it's gonna take a while to shift your microbiome. So, if it was me, I would definitely get on a healthy, nutrient-dense diet and, you know, get a microbiome test to kind of see where I need to fill in to make a more robust and resilient microbiome and also, more importantly, get all the nutrients and, more importantly, micronutrients that you need for your body to heal. Next question is from Flower Child. Hi, when we detox, my detox is no sugar, salt, processed caffeine, fake foods, etc. Are there any benefits of not drinking liquids during the time we sleep and a few hours before and after perhaps 
nine hours time frame. Thanks for the great info you provide. So Flower Child, I will personally say that I am not an expert in dry fasting um, or water fasting for that matter, but my goal is to stay hydrated. I believe hydration is critical. The, the water in our bodies help flush out toxins. So my goal is to not over consume water or under consume water. You know, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I live in an arid climate where actually my mouth is already dry and I just had a big 32 ounce, you know, fruit based smoothie to drink. And so it's my belief that it's really good not to be dehydrated, you know, so I would, you know, if you're thirsty, you know, drink water. Actually, if you're thirsty, you probably should have drank water before you were thirsty. But I would probably want to stay properly hydrated. Now, if you're not thirsty, yeah, don't drink water. The other thing, for some people, they can't drink water right before they go to bed because that'll actually disturb their sleep, in which case that's not a good thing. So I'd say, you know, you need to not drink water if you if you will wake up in the middle of the night at the peak because that's going to mess up your sleep cycle, which I believe is more important. <laughs> but then as soon as you wake up in the morning, drink some water to get hydrated if you need it. So that's what I'd tell you. Next question from Julie Jizz. Is there any concern in terms of EMF radiation from either of these? One, exercise equipment that uses Bluetooth or similar pair with an Apple Watch, assuming you're not using an Apple Watch. Two, Wi-Fi connected appliances like Roomba, iRobot, assuming you don't have Wi-Fi in your home. Thanks so much. All right, Julie. So, you know, I have meters that could test these things. And the meters will tell you the level of EMF that each device puts out. I would encourage you, if you're really concerned about this, because I know you asked a few questions about this, is to get a meter because some devices will put out a lot of EMF, you know, and then some devices will put out very little, you know. Of course, you know, I, I have Wi-Fi turned off in my house, but in my backyard, you know, there's Wi-Fi from the neighbors that, are, that I'm getting beamed into. But, you know, for me, you know, we cannot avoid all the EMFs in our lives, but we, what we can do is we can reduce and significantly reduce the EMFs that we're exposed to. EMFs are another stressor on our body. It's like your husband yelling at you, right? That's a stressor. It's like going out to exercise and, you know, if you over-exercise, that's too much stress. Exercising a little bit is good because it's hormetic stress that'll build you stronger. And maybe some Wi-Fi signals on some level, a little bit is probably a hormetic stress, but when it's just constant and never ending and always there, it's a constant stress. It's like somebody always tapping on your head. You know, and that, in my opinion, that's not good. So you would want to get a good meter. There's several meters you could get. You should research that. I'm not going to recommend any in this video. And then you could test, like your a router would put out a lot more high intensity signal than maybe like a Bluetooth that doesn't have as much energy behind it transmitting the signal. Um, my goal is to not have any kind of wireless devices that need to use Wi-Fi in my house. Now, that being said, on the outside of my house, I have security cameras that do use Wi-Fi, but it connects to my neighbor's Wi-Fi, so I don't tell anybody. Um, and it's an open Wi-Fi, so I'm not I'm not stealing it technically. He just didn't put a you know password on it. So yeah, so that's what I'm going to tell you. So you know, Bluetooth, you know, and things are definitely lower EMFs than like a Wi-Fi. So I'd be more concerned with a Wi-Fi than at Bluetooth. That being said, I don't use Bluetooth myself. You know, my goal is to use a wired, even use a wired, and they have air tubes, which are even, you know, next, after, better than wired, potentially. But, you know, my goal is to just do the best I can, and I would encourage you guys to do the best you can as well. I don't use an Apple Watch, and, you know, I want to get, like, a Aura Ring to, like, measure my different, you know, measurements and stuff in my body. I know the new ones, you could turn off the Wi-Fi on it, which is really cool, or the, you know, the signals it sends. Um, but a lot of the devices are only Wi-Fi. So when I had to buy a Roku TV, some of them are only Wi-Fi. And I had to find one that actually had a wired plug so I could wire Ethernet into it. So, yeah, I mean, each person will accept or deny, you know, certain levels of risk. And each person is free to determine what they think, you know, the risk they want to put themselves up against with. You know, I think the worst is, of course, using a cell phone right by your head. Next would be like, you know, Wi-Fi router sitting right, you know, next to your bed or in your bedroom where you're getting beamed 24-7. There's some Wi-Fi routers that could like turn their signal off or really low and all these things that they got some fancy stuff. My friend bought one in Puerto Rico. But yeah, that's what I'm going to tell you. So yeah. So uh, next question is from Mitchell Schwartz. 
What vacuum lids are you using in your January 8, 2022 video? What I eat in a day, raw vegan, now eats cooked food. What process are you using to seal those lids? Thank you. All right, Mitchell, so I don't know what lids I use in those, but I have many different lids and I've tested lots of lids over the years. And my current favorites are on Amazon. Links down below. It's basically a kit with a pump and it's a pink pump. Sometimes they make it a white pump, but the, the ones I recommend now are pink. Um, it's a pretty good pump. I've broken it, but it pulls the strongest vacuum I found and they're stainless steel lids with a plastic plug in the middle with a little gasket So those are the ones I recommend for you guys I'll put a link down below in this video so you guys could get it yourself uh, last time I posted a video like this um, You know they sold out really quick, but I think there's a better inventory now And there's a few sellers that sell them So if I remember I'll post a couple sellers down below that have a very similar uh, kind of setup Another question from Julie Jizz. I know you said Wi-Fi and cell phones are harmful, but what about actually listening to the radio? Is that bad as well? So if you're listening to the radio, like through, like, I don't know, your computer and it's wired, it's totally fine. But the radio, like, here's the thing. You have signals that you can't control and signals you cannot control in your life, right? The TV signals and the radio signals are just in the open air. So we're gonna get beamed with those you know whether we like it or not that being said in my opinion those the signal strength on those are a lot weaker than something that you're you know a cell phone right next to your head or a Wi-Fi signal so once again if you guys if you get one of those meters right if I'm in my house like where my bed is I put the meter on it detects like zero EMFs where I am you know and maybe you need a different kind of meter to you know detect the different frequency of, of that but the radio or the TV signals but you know what those you cannot do anything about unless you're super paranoid and you want to paint your whole house in like EMF reflective paint and then even make get make sure you have window like tinting that has the EMF reflective stuff so you can make an isolated you know whole building by that time you should probably just live in the forest in the middle of nowhere <laughs> so yeah I mean I encourage you guys to do the best you can not be super paranoid about these things you know there's probably more important things to concern yourself with unless you're already at the utmost level where you're doing all the best things then you just want to you know eke out just small little performance gains and you know minimize the stressors on your body which is you know my goal next question is from Lynn Silu 2 John may I ask a list of foods that you heat process and consume to create a more varied microbiome as I've been raw vegan since 10 months ago and I think I should start to heat process beans rice and such like too all right, so it's in the video down below. I'll post a link. You know, now I eat uh, heat processed foods and I go over the foods. In general, that's still pretty much my list. I haven't really changed too much. Maybe I've added a few additional things. So in general, I just go over them real quick. Artichokes. I love artichokes. They're very high in inulin. Um, that's probably number one. Number two, I do purple sweet potatoes, purple yams, which is a new thing because I have to actually go to the Asian market to find purple yams. They're real purple yams. And then I do purple potatoes. Actually, right now in the Instant Pot, I have mushrooms. Um, and I actually heat process the mushrooms. This time I put them on for 10 minutes, but normally I do them for like three to five minutes on the Instant Pot. And I do a variety of mushrooms. So not just white buttons. Actually, I don't like white buttons. I like shiitakes the most. My takis, things like lion's mane and even oyster mushrooms. I, and I, enoki mushrooms, I try to just go to the Asian market because they have lots of different mushrooms and I'll you know get the ones that are on sale that week or whatever ones I find that are good. Try to also source them from local farms. Um, let's see, besides that I also do the beans and the rice. So I rotate the different kinds of beans I get. I went to the Indian market and they have organic you know, beans from India which is cool and I got like Himalayan red kidney beans. I also really like the Urad Dao which is the black gram. Uh, that's actually high in omega-3 fatty acids. I also like black turtle beans. That's from like grocery. No, that's from uh, natural grocers. And you know, and then I'll do lentils. They cook really fast when I'm lazy. And then I also do the purple rice, uh, the, the uh, jasperi rice. You can find that on Amazon. It's a deep purple, so it's really rich in anthocyanin. So I'm trying to like, because the anthocyanins will, you know, feed our microbiome. Also the, you know, the starch and the rice. After it's been heated and cooled, it'll probably be more resistant. Feed our microbiome as well. I've also been adding in things like quinoa and millet. And probably, and I actually cooked some buckwheat the other day. Even did some oatmeal to test it out. Uh, you know, heated the oatmeal and then cooled it and then ate it. So 
basically I'm trying to expand the different kinds of foods I'm eating to not only feed me, but feed my microbiome. Also, the addition of these amounts of foods, they're in small quantities. It's not like, you know, I eat a ton of this stuff. You know, my goal is to eat, the majority of the food I eat is uh, raw, unprocessed, you know, plants, fruits and vegetables predominantly with smaller amounts of these items mixed in. Uh, let's see, aside from that, I might heat, pro I did some heat processed asparagus the other day because I didn't want to eat it raw, I was too lazy and I'm like, it might, if, if like I'm gonna, if heat processing a plant food, like especially a vegetable, will get me to eat it whereas I wouldn't otherwise eat it, then I believe that to be a good thing. That being said, I <laughs> would prefer to eat things raw or even juiced before I heat process them. So I just do the best I can. I mean, this time of year I'm having abundant greens in my garden, so I'll probably be heat processing more greens to crank up my green consumption. You know, and I mentioned in the last video, but one of the things I learned is that basically in the, the different forms you eat the food, so whether you eat it raw, it's gonna affect your microbiome one way, whether you take that same food and you heat process it, then you eat it, that's gonna affect your microbiome a different way, and if you heat process it and then cool it, depending on the food, it could then affect your microbiome even in a different way as well. So, you know, I don't know all the different ways it's gonna happen, so I'm just kinda doing more of a shotgun approach where most of my stuff is raw, because that's what I've been doing for so long, but then I'll do these, the heat processing to, you know, enhance my diet. When I do heat my beans and rice, you know, you're supposed to cook it in water, I don't cook it in water, I cook it in fresh juice that's raw, but then it's heated so it's not raw anymore. Usually I do tomato juice, um, last time I actually did watermelon juice, had a watermelon juice that wasn't good, so that, you know, the watermelon juice combined into the rice to probably give me some more lycopene that was now, you know, whatever, trans or cis lycopene because it was heat processed. So I do all kinds of crazy stuff and then I also add herbs and spices when I'm heat processing foods. So I think uh, those are all the major things that I could think of that I've been heat processing lately. Oh, and then I do a, a little bit of squash, not a whole lot of squash, maybe some butternut squash. Did a kabochi squash the first time and a spaghetti squash. But I'm, I mean, uh, everybody loves kabochi squash. Like, I, I, I'm not really, I didn't really see the benefit. <laughs> I wasn't like, ah, oh, this is so good or nothing. Like, whatever, I could, I could do without it. All right, next question from uh, Deed Eed. How dehydrating your fruits and vegetables at very low heat in sun or dehydrator, or is it still healthy and nutritious? So I guess the question is healthy and nutritious compared to what, right? Freshest is always bestest. I've been saying this forever in my videos and I would encourage you guys to eat your foods fresh as possible. That being said, you know, eating something dehydrated in the sun or in a dehydrator is still healthier than a vegan candy bar or vegan cookies or white rice, in my personal opinion, right? Um, that being said, if you, you ate freeze-dried fruit or vegetables, that's healthier than dehydrated fruits and vegetables because there's not the oxidation and you're not losing the different you know, nutrients that you would under dehydration. That being said, for dehydration, I, I do not recommend sun-drying because sun-drying, now you have a UV factor and now you have a light, now the light can degrade nutrients in the food, so I don't like using things, um, you know, dehydrating things in direct sun. Now you could do shade drying, which would be totally fine. Shade drying and then using this, the, the heat of the sun, but not direct sun, which would be better. Um, and then the other thing is uh, dehydrating at a low temperature, so, you know, that's, depends on your goals. If you want to maximize your nutrition, like phytonutrients, like things like lycopene and beta carotene and antioxidants, then actually you want to dehydrate at a hotter temperature, not a lower temperature. So maybe dehydrating at 140 degrees. And I know you're thinking, you're thinking, John, that's going to kill the enzymes, right? So you get to choose when you dehydrate. Do you guys want to save the enzymes or save the phytonutrients? And that is a choice only you can make. I'm not going to tell you what to make, or what to do, I'm gonna tell you for me, I prefer to preserve the phytonutrients because in my opinion, when I'm eating dehydrated foods, I'm not eating it for the enzymes. The problem is if you're dehydrating it at a low temperature, the enzymes are gonna stay active and the enzymes will cause the enzymatic browning and breakdown of some of the polyphenols and nutrients in the foods. So, you know, that's no longer my goal. That's something that I learned that is still even propagated to this day in the raw foods movement that you gotta dehydrate below 118 and you know that's I'm not the biggest fan of that although it's kind of built into my mindset 
So these days I may dehydrate at like 140 degrees for the first several hours, maybe up to four, maybe even six hours. And then after I get the majority of the water dehydrated out, then I could cut the temperature down lower to have like, you know, to 118 or whatever to, you know, just dehydrate the rest off at a slower pace. So now I'm, I'm reducing the overall dehydration time, which is my goal these days. All right, next question is from uh, Charlotte Sh Schaffler. I believe raw food romance eats 100% raw and her microbiome test was great and you don't and you said your test could have been better. How do you explain that? <laughs> so, you know, um, here's the thing. I'm not going to, you know, make claims on how raw food romance eats. I will say that her food is delicious. And if you look at her Instagram, at raw food romance, she makes and they eat some amazing foods. I will also say, you know, their goal isn't to eat all organic. So they eat, you know, a good percentage of conventionally raised foods. But they eat quite a good variety, you know. I try to eat a variety too. I source, try to source the best foods I can. I grow my own food. And you know, the diet, I want you guys to understand, diet is only one component of your microbiome. You could have the best diet in the world and your microbiome could still not be good, right? Because there are many other factors that, in, that, that will shift your microbiome besides just the diet. You know, because I had to rationalize this when I saw her results of her microbiome test, which actually, you know, are where I would like mine to be. Honestly, I'm, I'm gonna I'll tell you guys that because I ain't perfect. I'm not gonna claim to be perfect You know, I try to do the best I can but obviously what I've been doing has not been working for my microbiome And that's why I'm really big on microbiome these days because I was like whoa your microbiome kind of You know needs improvement John. I mean yes, my microbiome is better than the average American Absolutely, but I'm like wow, you know, it could be better And so that's why I'm concerned about a lot of raw vegans out there that are maybe restricting the foods and they're their microbiome may not be that good. Maybe it is, because here's the thing. Your microbiome, you have a base microbiome. So this base microbiome is like your microbiome that started out when you were a kid, and it goes with you your whole life. Your base microbiome, and that is, I, I mean, I'm no microbiome researcher, but from what I believe, that's very difficult to shift your base microbiome, right? If you have like an apartment building, and you have all the people living in there for 20 years, right? And they're on rent control, they ain't gonna move out, so it's hard to, how hard to get new people in that, you know, apartment building that have people for living there for 20 years on rent control. Maybe some of them, you know, pass away and then people new, move, new people move in, but nobody wants to move, right? So that's how your microbiome is, your base microbiome. Man, they don't want to move. They're like, this is my home, this is where I'm living, and I ain't going to let new microbiome things in, right? So that's one impact. So I'll say, I don't know how, you know, Raw Food Romance grew up or her microbiome as a kid because that would be the solid test. Do a microbiome when you're, you know, birthed maybe at 10 years old and 15 years old and kind of see where you are over time because maybe over her whole life her microbiome is probably better than mine, which I would probably say yes because especially when I was born I was not breastfed. That jacked up my microbiome. Maybe I shouldn't say jacked up. But it gave me an opportunity to improve my microbiome and then maybe... During my childhood years, I maybe didn't eat the best diet, which also maybe didn't give me the most robust microbiome, um, you know. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. So then, so that's one thing. Other things are maybe, you know, a lot of things could affect your microbiome. I mean, I have a garden. She doesn't have a garden. You know, I'm sure my garden gives me access to a lot of different microbiome things that she doesn't have access to living in an apartment, you know. That being said, you know, there's more than just the garden, you know, there's like, how is your sleep cycle and your sleep patterns? You know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that Liz has a better sleep and, and sleep cycles and all these things and more regimented than mine, you know? So, I mean, maybe that could change it too. I mean, all these factors, little factors, the exercise factor could change it, you know? So many things could change it and I'm definitely no expert on this, but, you know, it's something that's very important to me and that's why I'm a big you know, microbiome fan these days, as is raw food romance, and she's done things to improve her microbiome, and maybe I should live with her and <laughs> eat what her and Nate eat for a while, maybe my microbiome would improve too, and maybe it wouldn't, I don't really know, so yeah, so it's not all about just what you eat, so I want you guys to know that you have a base microbiome that's very hard to, you know, get it to budge or change significantly from what I've learned and what I believe, 
That being said, that's what I'm working on and it is a slow process. Oh, the other thing that will happen is that your microbiome changes over time. So I will say that, you know, uh, Raw Food Romance and I are different ages for sure. And so that could also be another reason for the differences. All right, next question is from uh, Maria Golda. How do you account for greens that are really high in oxalic acid like yam leaves? All the Asian people I've watched say to blanch leaves in boiling water for one minute to reduce oxalate consumption. All right, Maria, so check my lit video down below where I cover this in detail and pull up scientific studies, you know, on oxalates. And I'll give you a brief synopsis of that video here. Um, so oxalates are natural in food. They're plant defense mechanisms, if you want to call that. So herbivores don't eat too much of them. That being said, our bodies can handle a certain amount of oxalates. And this is dependent on many factors, maybe your genes, maybe your gut microbiome, because there are gut microbes that can digest oxalates. That being said, some people are prone to kidney stones and things, and so then they would not want to eat oxalates. So that's one factor. Some people can handle more or less. You know, people in Africa, they did. there was a study that I read that people in Africa, because they eat the oxalate foods from the time they were a child, have the bacteria in their guts to digest them. So they'd be able to handle higher levels of oxalates than Americans that have been eating processed foods their whole life without the you know specialized bacteria to do that. The other thing that I mentioned in the video is that I recommend traditional preparation techniques to reduce or minimize the oxalate consumption. You know, that's another very important thing. So, you know, hey, if Asians say to blanch leaves and you want to reduce the oxalates, then blanch the leaves. You know, that's what you got to do. The other thing you could do is you could also eat less of a quantity. So don't eat the yam leaves in such a high quantity, right? Eat a less, of, less of them so you're not going to get as much oxalates, right? I think it's a very bad idea to eat high oxalate foods on a regular basis. So, for example, every night you have spinach for dinner because you love the baby spinach at Costco, right? I mean, I don't recommend that I eat spinach maybe once a year when it's in my garden and then on random occasion when I see it on sale because I barely buy greens at the store because I have so many greens in my garden always to harvest and pick that I would prefer to eat. You know, I'm not a really big fan of Swiss chard, also another green high in oxalates, but I do like parsley a lot. But then I don't eat parsley every day either. I might eat it, you know, once or twice every couple weeks. So that's my thing. You know, you want to process it properly, eat the quantity that's right for you, your body, and you know, what you can handle. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> and then uh, let's see, next question from A plus. Which microbiome test did you have done and which website did you run it through? All right, so I did an Ombre Labs test. It's ombrelabs.com, I believe. And if the coupon code still works, you can try to use the coupon code WELCOME30 for 30% off discount, which is a really good discount on them. And then I ran it through a website called Microbiome Prescription, which is like the dude's a science geek guy. He took all these studies, put it into his AI kind of algorithm to kind of like correlate your microbiome CSV that you could download from Ombre Labs, put it in the microbiome prescription, and then he'll tell you like, you know, what's going on based on the studies and then what, what you know, probiotics they recommend and what microbes you do and don't have. Of course, Ombre Labs has their own interpretation and there are other different, you know, apps and things that you can put your data into. I think one's called Biome Site, um, you know, to get results to kind of decipher what your microbiome test means. All right, next question is from Kathy Bailey. If cooked fruits and vegetables are good, why does it drop your nitric oxide to nil? It is because it kills all the enzymes. So then how is cooked food be good? <laughs> all right. So once again, like, I mean, in my opinion, that question is like regarding like, it, it's like we're taking just one factor of food, which, you know, I agree that we should chew raw greens in our mouths, you know, to get the nitric oxide. It's very important. I don't even, re I don't recommend juicing your greens to get nitric oxide not going to happen. You guys need to eat greens. Now, more importantly, what many of those doctors don't tell you is that you want to get high nitrate greens that have higher nitrate content so that you can produce the nitric oxide, right? Depending on how the greens were grown, it could have higher or lower nitrate levels. Based on some scientific published studies I've seen in interviewing the expert on nitric oxide who, who literally worked his career studying this stuff, 
right? Organic foods did not have highest nitrate levels. Conventional foods did, and um, after he told me that, I, I, com I completely understood why as a gardener, because when you're, when you're doing conventional gardening, you're working on three minerals, NPK, and you're basically cranking in high nitrate in the soil so that so the plants will grow because you know conventional gardeners just believe that you need three main minerals to grow plants but really there's maybe 18 but then really there's like 70 to 90 that i believe are can be important for our human health so yeah so you want to get green so the best way to do that is growing yourself i mean actually this bed right here has arugula one of the best greens to eat and i'll tell you guys i i don't cook my arugula it's a waste to cook. I might cook my kale <laughs> when I have excess kale. I prefer to juice it first. But if I have so much, I can't eat it all and can't eat it in salads, right? I'll juice it. And if I got so much, I'll start the heat process and cook it so I can get more of it into me. So, but my arugula, you know, I always love to eat that fresh. I will never cook that. And it's rare, actually, that I even juice it because I never have enough arugula to eat fresh. So, yeah, so... We, we want to get away from this all or nothing. Like this one reason and the nitric oxide is why I should eat all my greens raw, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's an important reason. I'm not going to say it doesn't, doesn't make cooked food superior in that respect. But in some levels, heat, if like heat processing your food will get you to eat more kale instead of eating a, you know, rice or a candy bar, I don't think any of you guys would disagree that that's a healthier move in the right direction, right? you know under eating vegetables is the number one cause of disease in my opinion <laughs> you know and based on some of the studies you know not eating enough vegetables is super important yeah not eating enough fruit is important too but we want to get enough vegetables and like at this point in my life i'm like you know hey the best ways to get some vegetables in are raw just pick them fresh and eat them in your mouth i don't even take them inside i just pick them and eat them right in my garden that's actually absolutely the best grow some microgreens and sprouts eat them fresh eat them raw the next way I like to use them is I like to make them into juices so I can concentrate their nutrients. The next way I like to do is blend them into smoothies. And then after that, I prefer to like, um, you know, use them in my salads and soups, my raw salads and soups. And if I've done all those and I still have lots of greens, I'll heat process them, not only for my parents, but also for me these days to get more greens in me because they can be so beneficial. And I'd rather see gr cooked greens going to me than greens going to my compost pile because I didn't use them right they're gonna benefit me more and you know actually even before that though I dehydrate them to make kale chips before I heat process them but then sometimes I have so much I dehydrate as much as I can my dehydrator is full and then I still got more greens so I want to use them to benefit me so yeah so good better best is what I teach you guys and these are just like the levels of things that I go through to utilize all the greens that I grow in my garden so yeah that's what I'm gonna tell you Eat greens however you could. Yeah, raw is, is definitely better on the greens for sure. I'm definitely never going to really advocate for cooking your greens unless you will not eat them otherwise. I would always advocate for eating greens raw or, you know, uh, juicing them or even blending them or just, yeah, eating them fresh in salads. That's the best, guys. <laughs> so, yeah, but other things, heat process can be quite beneficial. You know, link down below to my video, you know, some of the foods I heat process, which, you know, only re started recently incorporating greens when I had so many greens I couldn't eat them raw. Maybe if I had a partner, she'd help me eat the greens and I wouldn't have to cook my greens. <laughs> so I'm putting my call out for a nice uh, partner that wants to have kids and then she could he help me eat my greens. So then I don't no longer have to cook them. I'd love that. <laughs> I'd love that more than actually cooking my greens and eating them. All right, so anyways, next last question today is uh, like cane. What about parasites on produce and vegetables? Does cooking kill all the bacteria and parasitical matter on the surface? How safe is it eating raw and what are the procedures to ensure safe and sanitary ways to go about it? So like that could encompass a whole entire video unto itself. So I will say that, you know, food sanitation is critical, especially on raw foods. You know, the USDA will say raw foods could cause, you know, outbreaks and all these things. And to me, it is about the sanitation. So in general, in, you know, First world countries that actually have you know rules about how produce is grown. You can't use things like raw manure that has not been composted, you know. And and if they're practicing these rules, we generally shouldn't have an issue with you know foodborne illness or parasites. It's when those rules are broken. So you're thinking, John, somebody got sick on cantaloupes and almost died or did die, or even on the salad 
greens or the cantaloupe, right? And that's not because the salad greens or cantaloupe, it's because they use manure or, you know, irrigated with manure or one of the farm workers, you know, pooped and didn't wash his hands and got some E. coli contamination on there. And then more importantly, the person's microbiome was not resilient enough to basically say, you're not coming in my microbiome because my microbiome is strong. So another reason to build your microbiome, in my opinion, the stronger microbiome, the more you will be resilient, in my opinion, you know, to foreign bacteria and things that could get in us. Of course, at some point, they're just going to get in you if the concentrations are too high and you're going to get sick. So you definitely want to be concerned about the food you're eating. Yes, now cooking kills bacteria and parasites and all these things. I haven't really researched cooking and parasites, but in general, eating raw foods, it can be more risky. That being said, I haven't really worried about it my whole raw foods career, buying things at the store. I've only gotten one, knowingly one time sick from a parasite. Um, actually, that's when I went to Costa Rica to a very unsanitary raw fruit festival. Um, and yeah, so I, that's when I got sick and I was not preparing all my own food. You know, so I was not washing it. I did not see how it was prepared. Yeah, and I don't know. So these days, I prepare all my own food that I'm going to eat. That's why I make 99% of what I eat. I rarely go out to restaurants, and I, I rarely ever get stomach aches or rarely ever get, you know, diarrhea or anything weird with my digestive system because I'm careful about how I prepare my food. If you guys go out to eat, you're up, you know, your health is and sanitation is up to how the restaurant's preparing it which actually I don't like to put my hands in a restaurant, especially when they can't even make things that are healthy enough for me to eat or want to eat, <laughs> which maybe on some levels is paranoid. But yeah, so, in, so if you're in a third world country, then you better be damn sure, especially tropical third world countries, you better be damn sure your food is clean. You know, they have rat lung disease. I know over in Hawaii that if a snail... If you eat a snail, that could kill you. Even if the snail has a rat lung disease and they, they slither across the greens and you eat the greens, you know, that could still have the whatever parasite or bacteria that is going to get you sick. So you got to wash everything and inspect every leaf carefully for any kind of, you know, foreign subject matter. You know, if you want to be really sure, you know, I spray things off with a high pressure spray that dislodges most things. I mean, any, anything that I buy in the store or grow myself, I, I either soak in water, do a water dunk, and then rinse it around, spray it off with high pressure water, then dry it, spin dry it. Sometimes when I spin dry things, I'll see caterpillars come out. I don't necessarily want to eat caterpillars, although I probably have eaten some aphids in my day. Um, so yeah, so just wash it really good. Now, if you're super paranoid, right, and you want to make sure your raw food is sanitary, right, there's a way that the USD did approve of. It's basically ozonation. So that I saw at a restaurant trade show where they basically ozonate water in a big, you know, sink with an ozonator. And the O3 will basically kill a lot of the different bacteria. So now that will render your food more sterile. <laughs> so it goes both ways. You're not going to have the good bacteria, but you're not going to have the bad bacteria either. Um, and you could also use uh, ultrasonic vibration. So they have machines from China that I, I have one. You could ultrasonic vibrate and ozonate the food if you want to make sure you get all the bacteria off that's going to make you sick if you're super paranoid but then you're not going to have the benefits of the potential you know good probiotics on the foods that you're going to get so you know it's a trade-off so it's like you got to use some common sense and you got to depend you got to determine like hey if it's in my garden i'm not really even concerned about parasites now if i go to costa rica and i see some dude pooping next to the field where he's harvesting my food from i'm probably not even going to eat there you know because that's just nasty so, and then if they're using animal manure that just smells like animal manure, that's gross, that's not properly composted, that can be problematic, right? So, I think each person needs to determine their level of risk and, more importantly, do their own research to find out if it's safe or not. So, that's what I'm going to say. So, how safe is eating raw? It's as safe as you make it, right? If you grew every morsel of your food and you know that it was done in, in good, clean conditions and you have good... I mean, I spray good bacteria all throughout my garden in compost tea and different bacterial sprays to kill the bad bacteria so not I'm not ingesting them, right? Do other farms do this? <laughs> Probably not, man. So it's not just for me, but it's also for my plants because when plants want good bacteria, they don't want the E. coli in the soil, right? They want good bacteria that's going to grow, that, that's going to help them survive and grow. 
so yeah that's, that's a lot of different things I could talk about but you know best way ozonate and ultrasonic you know if you're super paranoid to clean your food really good grow more of your own food you know grow microgreens and sprouts but even sprouts if you grow sprouts in a jar you don't get you know uh, certified sprouting seeds they may not have been tested for E. coli and then you get really sick from sprouting you know so you always want to tr get your seeds if you're sprouting and you eat them um, from a reputable seed seller such as uh, True Leaf Seeds in the US here anyways alright like so hopefully that answers your question it's a really in-depth topic and maybe I'll put together a video one of these days but you know for the most part I, I really have never had an issue with it you know oh and then here's one story I want to tell you guys real quick so I have that ultrasonic vibrator thing so I actually got some uh, yellow cat dragon fruit from rain at Miami fruit like the first time I seen those he sent them to me and I like oh man these are so good I had like three or four and then I was like on the toilet pooping like diarrhea I was like man there must be some toxic bacteria on these things that that like I gotta kill so then I put all the dragon fruits in my ultrasonic thing that kills all the bacteria vibrates them off and everything and then I ate them again and then I still had diarrhea I'm like what's going on even my ultrasonic vibrator thing you know an ozone thing couldn't kill the bacteria and I still got some food poisoning from him. I'm like call him up rain dude what's up man I'm getting food poisoning from your stuff he's like no 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 man he's like there's some stuff in there that's a laxative so you can't eat more than one of them at a time <laughs> so so then I researched that and I'm like, all right, he's right. So yeah, even, even if I try to use my ultrasonic thing on the yellow dragon fruit, you're still going to have diarrhea if you eat too many of them. So these days I may eat one or maybe two and I'll be fine. But more than that, don't do it. <laughs> all right. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, um, answering your guys' questions. If you guys enjoyed this episode, hey, please be sure to give this video a big thumbs up and share this with somebody else you think it can help. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss out my new upcoming episodes. I'll come out every five to seven days. You never know what will show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. And make sure you click the bell so you get notified as many videos come out. And finally, be sure to check my past episodes of past episodes. Our wealth and knowledge, over 600 episodes at this time, teach you guys all about my thoughts on diet and lifestyle. Links down below in the description to so some of the items and videos that I've recommended that you guys watch based on some of your questions. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best.